Tell you the truth, I don't even blame the bad guys. I, I just don't. I, I, I blame the DNC, who I just think are extraordinarily incompetent. You know, uh, you know. I mean, bad guys are going to be bad guys. That's what they do. You know what I mean? You're going to blame a bad guy for being a bad guy? He's a bad guy. You know what I mean? Of course he's going to be a criminal. That's what, that's what they do, you know? It's up to the good guys <laughs> to put him in jail or, or, you know, stop him or, you know, do the right thing. And that's what, that's what pisses me off. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Sunday interview. I'm your host, Tim Miller, with my co-host, JVL, with, oh man, we are lucky today. We've got Stephen Van Zant, author of a memoir, Unrequited Infatuations, great memoir name. Uh, he, you might have heard of him. Uh, he's in the E Street Band. He uh, played Silvio in Sopranos. Uh, he's in Lilyhammer. Uh, we can talk about the rest of it, a lot of other stuff. Little Steven was a solo act um, that I want to get to. So, Steve, if you don't mind... Um, this this the impetus for this was the circus is gets canceled and you are like the biggest advocate on social media oh. uh shit posting showtime for canceling the circus <laughs> which uh we really appreciated wow. and i reached out to you um so so thank you very much for being a loyal viewer well i mean the the, the timing is what got me you know yeah. i mean bad enough canceling you know one of the few real political shows on TV, but you're going to cancel it this year? Really? I mean, they're, they're, there's like nothing happening next year politically, you know? It, it did seem poorly timed. It was frustrating for me. So I will say this, though, I because I'm a 90s kid, so I knew you from like Sopranos and, hmm. you know, uh, E Street Band kind of re reunion era. And so I didn't... You know, I thought maybe you're just one of those guys that, like, you know, in your twilight years likes watching premium cable, you know? I didn't know, I did not know about your political background at all until I searched it up. I was like, why does he care so much about the circus? And so if you don't mind, I want to start there, because um, essentially, and if you, in your memoir you talk about this a lot, like, not, maybe not the only reason, but one of the key reasons from your initial departure from the E Street Band was because you wanted to do more political work, and then your solo act um was like almost entirely political so what like what was what motivated that for you yeah um basically growing up in in, in the 60s um meant um i call it the renaissance period and i and i and i mean that sincerely when the greatest art being made is also the most commercial you find yourself uh in a in a renaissance period um everybody had to have a very uh, specific identity, you know. Now that would change beginning in the seventies. I, I talk about this in great detail in the book, but but basically we went from a monoculture, surprisingly, surprisingly, because we're anything but a monoculture, as you well know. Um, but but artistically, you know, musically at least, at least in terms of popular music, we were very much a monoculture right through the sixties uh, until the seventies, which was the great fragmentation, you know. And um, uh, at that point, uh, uh, but, but having grown up with everybody having such a specific identity, even though that was be the beginning of hybrids, you know, from, the, from then on, starting in the 70s, there would be a combinations of, combinations of bands, you know. Um, Aerosmith would be the combination of the Rolling Stones and Aerosmith, for instance, you know. Uh, 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 I said it right? Aerosmith would be a combination of uh, the Rolling Stones and the Yardbirds, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and, and the various combinations of things um, would, would start to, you know, uh, create the, the new um, pop music. But, um, but having grown up with that, I had a very, a very strict sort of a, a definition in my mind. If I'm going to make solo records, what's going to be my identity? You know, um, the world doesn't need a bunch of love songs from a former sideman, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. <laughs> So I decided, you know, I, I'd gotten into politics um, just accidentally, started reading books for the first time in my life. And um, the first couple of books I read happened to be by Noam, Noam Chomsky. So uh, I kind of, you know, got very political very fast and um, decided, you know, that would be my identity. You know, there had been a couple of political songs here and there through the years, obviously, um, you know, Stephen Stills and Buffalo Springfield had for what it's worth and uh, Jefferson Airplane, uh, Volunteers of America. And the, the, the most notable would have been Crosby, Stills and Nash, uh, you know, Neil Young's Ohio, mm -hmm. you know, 
and Bob Dylan, of course, uh, right. here and there. But but basically, no one was doing it full time. So I said, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll just, I'll do nothing but politics, full time, and that would be my identity. And so I, I, I started this adventure, this artistic adventure of combining, you know, uh, journalism, and 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 art together, and and um, and started talking about political issues. Uh, the most notable of which, um, the actual, the one that got attention, of course, was. I work with South Africa on the Sun City project, where we um, really yeah, had well, a tell lot. Tell us about that because I just this was not. I mean, I don't know. JVL, maybe you, you know about this a little older than me, but I, like I, this was a total miss for me. I knew nothing. I did not know what Sun City was. So maybe just share with people like what you decided to do and why. Yeah, yeah. There, there was um, South Africa at the time had uh, these. Um, it was uh, well, I, don't, I forget the numbers now, but it was something like. You know, 26 million black people and 3 million white people, and the black people weren't allowed to vote, uh, among other problems. You know, it was, it was called the apartheid system, apartheid meaning separation. And um, it was just, a, it was just a, one of those countries that needed to be dealt with. And um, I felt, you know, with all the problems in Africa, and, and there's just, you know, they're endless, I thought no one's going to ever get to the other problems in Africa until we solve South Africa, which is just the most egregious of of them all. So um, I organized. It was it was the era of or, you know of multi artist uh, sort of events, and I, I, I we are the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are the world, and uh, the Christmas one, and, yeah. and they were mostly concerned with feeding people, you know feeding people in Africa, which is great. Yeah, you know. But I took my my thing was drawing the line between social concerns and political concerns. So my my record, you know, polit politics, you know, you name names, you know, you, you say, here's what's wrong. Here's here's who's doing it. And here's how we fix it. You know, so I actually named Ronald Reagan in, in the song, you know, which at the time you may recall, he was God or maybe before your time. Actually, it was before your time. But he was he was uh, he was godlike at the time. And uh Everybody was a very big fan of his, except me. And um, anyway, so we um, we had a lot to do with uh, raising the consciousness of, of the country because it wasn't even an issue in America. The whole apartheid uh, thing was big in Europe. You know, they were they were more aware of it, but we weren't really um, that into it in America. And so we made it an issue for the first time, and we're able to raise the consciousness to, to the level where because we knew the um, the um, the um, disinvestment, you know, the, the financial legislation was going to come that was going to basically shut South Africa down. You know, the, the basic uh, uh, disinvestment, you know, uh, legislation. And so yeah. we had to, and we knew Reagan was going to veto it. And at that time, there was no such thing as overriding a Reagan veto. And so we had to really work hard to make sure that the consciousness was such that we were able to actually override his veto, and that's exactly what happened. The legislation came across his desk. He vetoed it as we expected, and it was overridden uh, with Republican votes. May I add, uh, very very different Republican Party. Different back era, then. you know. Yeah, more like my but my the, father's. Uh, the, my my father was a Goldwater Republican, so I know oh, really? all about that. I know all about that world. Yeah. And, the Sun uh, City element of it, though, is like so interesting because that's the part that I think you guys had a direct impact on. I mean, that was the part that I was unfamiliar with because it was, it's like it's Vegas basically. It was oh, South, yeah, South sorry, Africa to Vegas, yeah. and everybody would go play. Yeah, I'm trying. I was trying to summarize, but yeah, I would skip that part. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. A, it was a resort. Uh, okay, let, let me just go back sixty seconds here. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, the, no, you're doing great. They had looked at our. At the time, my foundation was dealing with mostly with Native American issues, and they took a look at our how we had dealt with Native Americans and decided what a good idea this whole reservation thing. But they couldn't get away with the reservation thing, so instead they said, "You know what? We're going to put we're going to make it a tribal thing, and bring all of the black people back to their tribal homelands, okay, forcibly." Uh, the idea being, uh, we will take all, and they're all basically uh, workers, you know, you know, working in the in the mines, right? So we'll, we'll we'll get all of the black people back to their homelands, which was just kind of fictitious, you know. They weren't very tribal in South Africa, except for the Zulu, the whole other story. But but basically, the, the attitude was not very tribal, 
And they had no idea where their homelands were. You know, it was just a complete sort of bullshit kind of routine. And they, so they, they, they started to um, bring back all, the idea was to bring, back, bring, bring all the black workers back to their homelands, then make South Africa a democracy, and then bring them all back as immigrant labor, you know, migrant labor, you know. Um, which was a you know brilliantly evil scheme, you know, uh, and um, and so one of these phony homelands was Baputuswana, which is where this resort called Sun City was. And what they were doing was overpaying everybody to come play Sun City because the uh, the United Nations um, boycott was already in place. That had been in place almost since the beginning of the United Nations, very early on. So. Um, and they were really pissed off. The sports boycott, especially, was was very effective. They were really pissed off about that, uh, that they couldn't take part in the Olympics, you know. Um, so you get the sport the sports boycotts going on. The the economic boycott is the home run that we have to hit, and in between is the cultural boycott. And that's so. I, that's why I thought let's 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 do that and connect the two, and we can also publicize what's going on. So. We basically exposed the whole phony homeland concept and said to, to people who are being overpaid to go play the Sun City Vegas type resort, boycott the resort. Because by, by, by playing that resort, you're, boy, you're, you're violating the UN boycott, you know, without knowing it. You know, and, and we gave everybody the, the benefit of the doubt. You know, they, were, you know, they weren't, it was, it was very confusing for people. They were paying them like a lot. I mean, like, you know, I forget how much. Uh, like two million a, a week or something to go down and play, um, and and so we 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 cut off the Sun City Resort immediately. It was a, a immediately effective, and we were also able to bring the attention of the entire apartheid uh, issue to America. And like I said, um, you know, Bill Bradley brought me to the Senate to speak to the Senate about it, and. Uh, and we were able to really raise the consciousness uh, to the point where we overrode a, a Reagan veto. And, uh, and once, once that legislation went into place, uh, it fell like dominoes. You know, the unholy trinity, as I called them, which was Reagan, Thatcher, and Cole, you know, the UK and, and Germany, uh, they had to follow suit. And um, once the banks cut them off, they had to release Nelson Mandela. And, you know, it became a, it became a you know... A, so, it was a great song. We yeah. we ain't gonna play Sun City. It was not <laughs> subtle. Um, did Did you ever get to meet Mandela? Mandela, yeah, yeah. He came. Uh, I met him twice. Um, just had one short conversation with him, unfortunately. But um, uh, we um, I, I met him. We did two Wembley shows once to get him out of jail, and then once to celebrate that we got him out of jail. <laughs> 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 and then he came to America because they were about to have their first uh, election, you know, and so uh, he was just another guy running from, a, a, you know, polit his political party, you know. Yeah. Uh, so all, all the different, uh, ten, 10 different cities in America, I think it was, all promised, uh, you know, half a million dollars. And there's a whole story that goes with that that's, that's in the book. But, but basically, um, I met him when he came down to the Tribeca Grill. Me, me and, and Bobby De Niro and Spike Lee and Eddie Murphy put on a, a dinner with Mandela at the Tribeca Grill, you know, at De Niro's place. Uh, and, um, and he came down and we had a little, we had a little conversation. And uh, that, was, that was, you know, he, he was a, a remarkable man. You know, I, I haven't met anybody quite like him. Muhammad Ali was, was close. Uh, but they, certain people have that kind of aura, man. It's like, you know, you picture the holy men of the past, you know, be they you know real or, or not but if, if they you know you picture like a jesus christ or, or a moses or mohammed or Bo a buddha you know um having a certain aura and he had that he had that kind of really mystical kind of aura about him uh muhammad ali had a little bit of that too but but mandela was really it was really striking when you met when you met him he just had a thing that was unique you know what um Okay, fast forwarding to now, what like there is conversation about all this. Like you were kind of filling a void, right? Like other people weren't doing this, and you see this now, where now there's like all this pressure on musicians to do it. Like, where are you on 
like the oh Taylor Swift should be speaking out more kind of di- discourse or like wh- like where where do you think now fast forwarding what 25 years from that like like what is what's the obligation of artists well uh, i think we're you know we're citizens first and uh i i've always told people look you know do your homework before you open your mouth first of all um but you know you have every right to 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 do so you have every right now you know and and know that you're gonna you're risking some of your uh, commercial success Fortunately or unfortunately, I had no commercial success to risk, <laughs> so I didn't. I mean, <laughs> you you so did bad. have epically bad timing. I guess we kind of fast forwarded that. I mean, you literally <laughs> were like, "I'm gonna leave Bruce Springsteen and and do <laughs> and do my own thing where I focus on advocating for apartheid." Right as Bruce Springsteen became the Taylor Swift of 1983, like right, like like True. right at the moment. That 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 takes a certain gift, you know. It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, yeah. So, so I wasn't, um, I wasn't feeling, yeah, that kind of risk of my of my uh, career, <laughs> which didn't exist. But, but people like Taylor Swift, or you know, um, they have to know that you know you are gonna you are gonna piss some people off, and it's gonna cost you some sales. But in her case, uh, it no longer matters, uh, yeah. luckily. But uh, no, I, I encourage people to you know. Do the homework. If you're going to get involved, you know, don't just don't just um, speak uh, em- emotionally or, or you know, uh, after one incident happens, you know, don't generalize about, you know, do a little do a little research before you start talking about it is all I can encourage people to do. Um, I wanted to kind of get your take while we're still in the political realm before we get to the fun stuff on. So Bruce and you, like with the E Street Band, it was intentionally like blue collar, right? Working class and like not running away from that. I forget you had a quote where you walked down and and or in the book where you're talking about this, how like you, this was it was like it was not there was no attempt to, you know, kind of run away from that every man vibe about America. And you know, I mean, I, I guess what you're saying is even in the '80s, there's still a little bit kind of a divide between the Reagan era. <clears throat> you know, Reagan Democrat blue collar um, culture, but I don't know. I just, I think, I just wonder how you think about that today, right? In that the 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 blue collar working class like political culture these days is like pretty toxic, and I don't, I just don't, I don't know if there is a way for somebody in the entertainment space to try to bridge that in a way yeah. that's better. You know, I don't know. We had. Um, I had Amanda Shires, Jason Isbell's wife, on on here a couple weeks, a couple months ago. And we were talking about that Jason Aldean song about, you know, kicking people's ass in a small town, and all, like it's just so fucking toxic. I just anyway, I just wanted to kind of pick your brain on that whole kind of concept. Well, it's 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 so complicated now. Um, you know, um, and uh, by the way. Um, your, your book is just terrific. Uh, absolutely, one one of the best books I've read in, in many years. You, you, you really, um, you know, you, you, first of all, you're just a great writer. But um, it was just really interesting seeing that that picture of you know from the inside of the on the Republican side of things. Because uh, I'm 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 personally I'm I'm an independent law and order liberal. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, that's 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 how I would. You did tell it. us. I wasn't going to throw you under the bus, but you did tell us in the green room that you had a police charity that you were working on this week, yes. and you know that's uh, that this couldn't this isn't like exactly the best the best moment in um in le- in lefty kind of Hollywood America to be raising money for cops. I wouldn't say. Yeah, it, it, it my timing is is usually quite quite good, as you mentioned before. Um, <laughs> This is, you know, for, for two charities, you know, uh, children with special needs and widows and children. And, uh, yeah, I, I am very, very much a big police supporter. And um, I don't understand why everybody isn't. Uh, you know, I don't understand the whole defund the police thing. It's insane, frankly. I mean, go to any black neighborhood and ask them if they want more cops on the street or, or less, you know. Um Anyway, uh, yeah, my, 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 my fundraiser was just a couple of days ago uh, since this is airing. 
when this is when this airs. But but um, yeah, it's difficult every year. It's difficult every year to get people to support uh, anything having to do with the police, which I don't understand uh, personally. Yeah, yes, there's some problems there, uh, as as we know. Uh, but it needs more funding, not less. You know, they need to. Uh, that's a whole other story. But anyway, but this um, is kind of related, actually. Though, I mean, again, in your era, when Bruce and when the when this band is coming up, right? Like these working class jobs, it was they were union jobs. A lot of Democrats, you know, police, fire, and and as the left has gotten more college educated, more disconnected from that, you know, the right has filled that void. And in my sense, in kind of a toxic way right in the way that yes. they talk about those issues well yeah because it, it it's oh my god where do we begin with this right I mean, <laughs> it, 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 my my thing is it, when the good guys are in charge you know if, if they don't take care of the problems then they leave the door open for the bad guys to come in and that's what keeps happening you know um you know the demagogues come in i mean I, we I, I just did two world tours with my band, the Disciples of Soul, even before the E Street tour, and people are are unhappy with their lives worldwide. Okay, it's not just an American thing. All right, they're really unhappy with their lives. Okay, uh, they're working twice as hard for you know half the return. Right, they, they, nobody has any time off anymore. Everybody has two jobs. You know, money has basically lost all of its value. Right, you know. Um, so um, along comes uh, the demagogues and says, and they say, um, you know, I know you're very unhappy with your life, but guess what? It's not your fault. Okay? It's the black guy's fault. It's the immigrant's fault. It's the other religion's fault. Right? You know. And, of course, the working class is like, oh, <laughs> what a relief, <laughs> you know. <laughs> For a minute, I thought it was me, but uh, you know, so oh, it's, oh, it's that guy's fault, you know. And and you know, it's just human nature, I guess, to want to blame somebody, you know. And so that's going on worldwide. That that sort of blame blame the other guy for your miserable situation, um, because the good guys, when they're in charge, don't 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 take care of it. Yeah, you know, and, and there's reasons for that. You know, with the, you know, the with this the Congress being so fucked up. You know, uh, etc. But but you know, um, you know, the minimum wage. You know, healthcare. I mean, all of these issues. And and I and I tell you the truth. I don't even blame the bad guys. I I just don't. I I, I blame the DNC, who I just think are extraordinarily incompetent. You know. Uh, you know, I mean, bad guys are going to be bad guys. That's what they do. You know what I mean? You're going to blame a bad guy for being a bad guy? He's a bad guy. You know what I mean? Of course he's going to be a criminal. That's what, that's what they do, you know? It's up to the good guys <laughs> to put him in jail or, or, you know, stop him or, you know, do the right thing. And that's what, that's what pisses me off. You know, you know, the DNC, and you know this, Tim, better than me, they don't contest two-thirds of the races. You know that? They don't even contest them. I'm like, how do these two jerks from Kentucky keep getting, you know, voted in by the working class every 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 six years? You know, they they not only despise government, they hate the working class. They have nothing to do with the working class. How does you know McConnell and Rand Paul get get, get elected every every six years? It's because nobody's going door to door in Kentucky saying, "Do you understand what these guys voted down? They voted down your minimum wage and your health care and you know you whatever you know all this good stuff you know that the government's here to help you with. They keep voting it down. Uh, you know, I mean, somebody needs to explain that to these people. I think you know, and I and I just think the DNC do a do a terrible job. I mean, they, you know, they... Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if you're still playing your consigliere role with Bruce, but I do think that um, like one absence, one gap is that there just aren't... The Democrats have struggled to find people that can speak to that demographic. And a lot of times it's from self-selecting, right? It's, call it, it's, it's the types of folks that are going to IVs and living in the coasts, like, don't... Are, are struggling to be able to carry that message that you're talking about, you know? We, we do it all, all day long. That's all we do. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's That's... That's our people. That's who we are. You know, we're, we're working class people ourselves. You know, that's where we come from. And, um, 
everything in Bruce's work and in my work, you know, it all, it all, it all, it's all very, very specific. And, and, you know, in the end, I, I just, uh, it's up to, it's up to the, it's up to the good guys to, to explain these things to the people. And I, and I just don't think it happens. You know, it just doesn't seem to happen when you don't, you don't contest two thirds of the races. I'm like, how, how are you supposed to win? You know? All right. Well, we, we might be uh, we might be moving you to Lexington um, to have you take this on. Uh, I don't know if you if you got a, if you got a second place there. Uh, JVL, do you want to take us out? Where where do, do, do we want to talk? Bruce first, music. Do you want to talk Sopranos? Where do you want to go? Well, I'm passing I mean, the I'd, baton. Hell, I I'd love to start with music. Um, okay, great. Because Let's I so that. you know, born in the USA, that album comes out. I'm like ten years old and. It's one of the first records that I just sort of latched on to and started listening. And then, you know, as I got older, older I went back and did other stuff um, from Springsteen. I just, you know, you were, I, I've never spoken to somebody before who played at Wembley. Like, what's that like? <laughs> that must have been, I, like, yeah, first, so first, what, what is the scene like in Asbury Park as you're coming up, you know, back in the old days before before everything broke big what was that whole world like because every you know like in almost every rock musician has that story about the scene you know like the axel rose will tell you what the la rock scene was like before guns and roses broke big yeah uh, and you were part of like a real scene around asbury park in the jersey shore so start with that what was that like when you were a kid yeah it, 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 by the time we got to asbury park um it really wasn't much of a scene we, we had to kind of create it um there had been riots, you know. These, these, are, this is the years of the riots, uh, yeah. starting, you know, in the late late sixties. And there's lots of riots uh, for lots of good reasons, um, lots of assassinations, and you know, um, and so Asbury. By the time we kind of got there, uh, we all came from different, you know. I came from the north. Bruce came from the west. And we kind of all met, you know, in this because of this one club in Asbury Park called the Upstage Club, which was open from eight o'clock at night to five in the morning uh, for kids, mm. you know, no no booze, you know. Uh, so it was a very unique uh, kind of moment, um, and um, and uh, the rent was really cheap because you know, <laughs> no, it was a it was a, it was yeah. a ghost ghost town. Um, uh, the, the rides were still open on the weekends for a while before that stopped completely eventually. But, um, you know, the Ferris wheel and stuff was still working on the weekend. So people would come down on the weekend. And um, and once we moved from Upstage Club, we, we, we went across the track, so to speak, to the, to the and became a bar band, which was a, a difficult transition to make. Because in those days, you had to play the top 40 if you wanted to play in a bar. And by the seventies, top forty was not very cool. It, it, it was the coolest music, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the highest evolution of our art form was uh, the pop music of the sixties. Uh, but by the seventies, you know, albums had taken over. You know, you know, um, more. Uh, it was, a, it was a, quite a quite a shift from singles to albums and and all of that. Mm-hmm. But basically, the top forty was no longer hip. So um, we found a club uh, that was going to go out of business. Um, my memory is that the roof had caved in from a hurricane or something. And so we mm-hmm. talked the owners into into uh, hiring us, but we wouldn't charge them anything. We would just charge, you know, just play for the door. They take the bar, but we get to play whatever we wanted, which as far as I know, was the first time that ever happened in New Jersey. And... Um, and because they were going to just, you know, they were going to close like, you know, six weeks later, just trying to, you know, get what they could out of, out of, the, out of the tourists in the summer there. Um, and we, you know, we had 50 people the first week and then, you know, and then 100 and then 200. And then they fixed the roof, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and we ended up... Um, we ended up uh, selling out, you know, we, we went to two, a, a second night, went to a third night. So we, we, um, we created this residency um, and we created a scene, basically, that, that didn't really exist. Uh, at the same time, Bruce had, had gotten signed, which was a big deal to get a record deal. But even though that was a big deal and kind of raised his prestige a little bit, 
Uh, his first two records hadn't sold at all. So um, the nature of the business, you know, you, you sort of, uh, again, I go into much more detail about this, but, but, but um, the business, if you, if you will, was, was three levels. Okay, you had your teenage years where anything goes, which was great, complete freedom. Then you have the bar band years where, you know, whatever you can do. And then you get into the business. If you're lucky enough to get into the industry, then, then there's the industry years. Well, when you get to the industry, now there's different rules apply. You know, different rules apply to all three strata. And um, the rules once you're in the industry is you have to play to showcase clubs. Every city had a, show a showcase club in those days. Um, and so you would play the showcase clubs, and in those days, the record company would give you tour support, believe it or not. It's amazing. You know, <laughs> they give you a quarter million dollars to go on the road. In addition to the quarter million dollars they would give you to make your record, <laughs> which you manage to spend every penny of, you know. I mean, my, my record company <laughs> now makes like makes like 50 albums for that, for that amount of money, you know. But, um, I won't ask you for a ledger of where the money was going. <laughs> and it wasn't even going up our nose yet, by the way. <laughs> that, that, that'd be a little bit later. Uh, but you, so, so you played at Showcase Clubs, you know, and, and he had done that. And then you go back a second time. And then that's it. And then you can't work unless, unless you graduate to the theater level in those days, um, we were kind of done, you know? So Bruce couldn't work anymore, so he was hanging out with us, you know, at, at, which was Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. That was the band I, we had started, me and Southside had started, and um, and we were having all the fun. I mean, you know, it, was, it no, wasn't I mean, that much, In I mean, retrospect, shouldn't it have been Bruce Springsteen and the Asbury Jukes? <laughs> should it have been? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was a different band. It was. Okay, I don't know. I mean, that has kind of a. I don't know. It's got a ring to it. Okay, I'm just saying. While we're while we're while we're reflecting, I'm not sure Southside would agree with that exactly. Yeah. But but uh, okay. no, he Bruce had gone off with the E Street Band, and um, yeah. So me and Southside Johnny just started the Jukes, and uh, and it was a real bar band. You know, we were playing you know album tracks from Otis Redding and Sam and Dave, and and you know just you know. Uh, different things that were on the radio and, and uh, anyway so so Bruce starts hanging out with us and and it became I, mean, I think that I think that brought a little bit more prestige to the scene I, I don't know but um pretty soon we were selling out three nights a week and uh and then the Jukes got a record deal and on we went and then I and then I ended up joining the East Street Band after that uh you know and that was that. What's it like from going from playing in, in a bar to playing Wembley? Well, uh, in our case, I mean, you build that audience one person at a time in those days. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. like you went from the Stone Pony to Wembley. <laughs> you sure. know, sure. you go to a, you go to a town three or four times in a year, and you play the club, and then you play two clubs, and then you play three clubs, and then you play the theater, then you play two theaters, and you play three theaters, then you play the arena, and you play two arenas, and then you play the stadium. You know what I mean? Uh, right. You had to, you know, so you're building that audience, you know, literally one person at a time. So by the time you get to the stadiums, um, you know, you feel like you know half the people in the audience already, and um, and you've had a chance to make that transition artistically, you know, uh, by then, uh, to, you know, if if you're lucky. I mean, and uh, unfortunately, I think those days are over. I, I, we're not. We're not being replaced. It doesn't look like, um, you know, Taylor Swift aside, uh, you yeah. know, the rock world isn't, isn't quite um, as healthy as, it's t as, as as we'd like it to be. You know, it's tough. I'm even hearing some here in New Orleans, and like that. So that stuff still comes through here, right? And but like, you know, I don't know. Do you know the band Wednesday from your underground garage? They're like kind of a, a hot punk rock band. You should check them out. Wednesday had a really so they had this great record this year. That's like you know, it was like a Pitchfork top five record. And, you know, I went to see them at this bar and there's like 50 people there. You know, it's just, yeah. it really is a lot. Like, that's just the nature of the thing. But what, what yeah. other thing on music, music, though, I had to ask you when I was listening to one of your other interviews, you said that uh, in the New Orleans scene, I'm in my Tipitina shirt, you said that uh, uh, Alan Toussaint was one of your influences. And that kind mm. of surprised me because I don't like really think about the the bridge between 
kind of the New Orleans funk scene and and Bruce. So like talk about that. I, I don't really. It's hard for me to get my head in the eras. So, like he's older than you guys. So like how like what was in what way was it an influence? Well, I mean, first of all, and I know this is not easy. And believe me, I I I've been dealing with it you know for fifty years. Um, there's Bruce's world, and then there's mine. Um, right, I guess that's... So you're speaking more of the, the Disciples of Soul. Yeah. When you were talking about that, you were talking about the Disciples of Soul. Yeah. Got it. That makes more yes. sense. And so um, it, it's just one of the one of the main influences. You know, it was, it was New Orleans. It was it was Memphis, you know, and, and, and Chicago. Um, you know, three the three main, you know, cities, uh, be it uh, soul music, um, the old R and B or blues, you know that's pretty much um, the main influences, really. You know. Uh, so, but I, I guess I meant when you peeled <laughs> off and you're doing the Disciples of Soul, like you went and met with those guys, like you had studio sessions, like how did I like, or or like or with, you're just listening to them and it was an influence. With Alan Toussaint, you mean? Yeah. No, not yeah. I, I met Alan just briefly, but. Um, we brought up Lee Dorsey out of retirement and, and had him on the first Jukes album. Oh, really? Uh, so he was, yeah, a big, a big staple of the New Orleans sound, uh, working yeah, with yeah, Alan Toussaint. And, um, of course, I would meet the meters later and, and, be, and be friendly with, with, with them. But, um, um, no, you didn't, uh, you didn't often necessarily meet people. Um, you, just, you just listened to their records, you know, and were influenced yeah. by their records. And... Uh, and Alan Toussaint had a unique kind of thing because my, my thing got in, I got into horns very early, so Alan's uh, arrangement horn arrangements were, were always spectacular to me, and, and um, one of the, my main influences, in addition to the other, you know, the Motown stuff and the Stax stuff. Um, so yeah, it was just a, another another one another one of the influences in those days coming from this Renaissance period. Where this, you know, extraordinary amount of music was coming at you every 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 week, something new, you know, amazing. The other thing you were early on, I wanted to ask you about, and then I want to get to Sopranos, but was um, like so that Sun City record we were talking about earlier. Like you brought all these guests together, and some of the guests were like on that song were Run DMC and some of these early kind of hip hop guys. I mean, that had to be like you were that that was not really happening in 19. When was True. the Sun City record? 1985, 84, 85. Yeah. Like, I don't think that like was that the first time that had happened that like the rock world and the hip hop guys were 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 blending. Or was, yeah. Or, yeah. I think um, I think the Aerosmith run DMC thing was, was just after that, I think. But um, at the time, it was not hip. Uh, you know, the, the whole the whole. It wasn't even hit, called hip hop yet. It, you know, it was still called rap music, and and um, the industry was trying to squash it. They didn't. They didn't get it. They, they didn't. They didn't want. They didn't relate to it. And um, I felt very strongly about it. And so did the other my other three compatriots on on the on the Sun City project: uh, Arthur Baker, Danny Schechter, uh, um, and Hart Perry. Um, you know, um, we felt very strongly about this new this new thing called rap music because it was a chance for black people to express themselves for the first time. Uh, something that had been a prerequisite in the white world, in the white rock world, you know, starting with Bob Dylan, obviously. Um, um, you know, in order to be a serious white rock artist, you, you know, you were required to express yourself. I mean, that was uh, what the art form was all about. Um, You're saying that in the context of like how the soul guys had got, you know, the oh, the Marvin Gaye's and them, they had been squashed, quashed, right? Like they didn't want well, them that, to but, do anything well, that would scare white people, right? Isn't that, yeah, that that's mean? right. That's right. But but Marvin Gaye was the was the uh, yeah. the thing that broke through because, and it was a big, big fight he had with, with Barry Gordy, uh, head of Motown, and, and uh I think they held up. I think they held up that album for like a year. Uh, what's going on? Um, because uh, Barry Gordy was scared to death that it was going to end his end Marvin Gaye's career and end Motown, who were already uh, shaky at that point, uh, beginning beginning in the early seventies. It started to become a little shaky. Um, this is before the Norman Whitfield psychedelic soul stuff started. Um, you know, they would have a whole second. A whole whole second 
um, career, you know, with with, with the uh, starting with them and, and then the Jacksons after that. But um, but Marvin Gaye w w really broke through with what's going on, and, and it was not encouraged. And, and in fact, it was discouraged. And um, and then Stevie Wonder did the same thing. He he started to express himself with those next couple of albums. And so it started to loosen up a little bit, but it wasn't quite a normal thing yet for for black artists to like to be that expressive. Now, we, of course, there were some some exceptions. Sly and the Family Stone, certainly. Sure. Um, George Clinton, certainly. And before oh, yeah. that, in the jazz world, uh, Gil Scott Heron. You know, it wasn't really rock music, but but Gil Scott Heron. That's why he was so important. It was so important to me to have him on the Sun City record. He was on the Sun City thing too, yeah. Yeah. Um, so 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 here comes this rap music, and and now it's like, wow, man, they're like really talking about what's going on, you know. And I wanted to encourage it. And uh, the industry people said to me, "Man, you're, you're you're blowing this Sun City thing by putting them on the record. What, you're going to put Melly Mel on next to Miles Davis and." and and, and Jackson Brown, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I was like, yes, I am. You know, I, I feel that strongly about it. You know, I think this is a, really a healthy thing for the industry. And um, so we were the first ones, I think, to really give rap, which was about to be called hip hop, um, the credibility, you know, because we were all about credibility. That's all that's all that's all we did was credibility, you know, Um so it was, a, it was an important moment, I think. Yeah. All right, so I'm sorry. One more thing about this. Then JV, I'll pass over to you for The Sopranos. It just, I'm just listening to you talk about it. I'm just struck by, like, uh, I forget, one of your other interviews I was listening to, you said, you know, had you stuck with Bruce in the E Street, right, when it was taking off, you know, who knows what you would have done, right? Like, you might have just been sitting on your yacht, like, drinking champagne. And there's something, and this, like, goes to a lot of what we talk about at the Bulwark in a different context, is just, like, there's something about making a change that, to do something that you feel is fulfilling, you know? And like, you have, like, you have to kind of look back on that and feel very fulfilled, even though maybe, maybe your house isn't as big as it could have been. You know, you as, <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't have as many properties as you might have, but there has to yeah. be something fulfilling about that. Right? No. Yes, yeah. No. no. I'll I, I tell you the truth, man. Uh, this was, uh, I, I really uh, felt better about the whole thing. Uh, ha having written the book. The book really, really did help me in, in that way because in the back of my mind, all these years, I've always said, you know, if only I could have stayed in the band and done all these things at the same time, you know, I would have the perfect life, you know? Right. And then when you go back, because I never, I never look back, right? I never, I'm never, I never, I'm never looking right. back. But now you're writing a book, you have to look back, right? So now I'm, I'm, I'm reliving my past for the first time. And as I go through it, you know, you start to say, oh, I see why I did that and why and how that led to that. And by the way, there's no way I could have done both of these things at the same time. Wow. Well. Uh, and you can't I think, go commercial and like get, get commercial and get on radio and get famous, and then at the same time you're like, oh, okay, now I'm going to do an apartheid record. <laughs> you know, well, like that probably like, wouldn't have know, worked. Or 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 or, it's, or saying to Bruce, you know, by the way, would you mind? I, I'm going to take six months off and see if I can act. <laughs> you right. know, right. if I can become an actor. You know, yeah. <laughs> would would you mind just kind of, you know, yeah. going on hiatus for six months? <laughs> you know, so I mean, and and, and look, I, I was hoping the book. The reason why I wrote the book was I was hoping it would be, it would be useful to people. Okay, um, you know, and, and and I think yours is also, by the way, uh, but but. but um, you know, because in the back of my mind, uh, you know, when I left the East Street Band, I wasn't just changing jobs. I was ending my life. You know, my life ended. Uh, I didn't have a plan B. I didn't have anywhere to go. And so now you look back and you think, well, I thought my life ended at the time. But everything I've accomplished, I did since then, since I left, you know. Right. So I thought that could be useful to people who hit the wall, you know, your, your your original dream doesn't work out, you know, whatever your original dream job or whatever right. it might be, you know. You, you, I'm you, never going to be White House press secretary, baby. It just is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and just when you think your life's over, if you can find a way to keep moving forward somehow, you know, don't succumb to drugs or alcohol or suicide, all of which I considered. Resentment. 
you know, yeah, if you can just kind of move forward, you know, you'll find a destiny, maybe has some other things in mind for you. So I was hoping that the book would be useful that way. But um, but it made me it made me feel a lot better about my <laughs> seemingly insane decisions. You know, uh, when I look back now, I'm like, you know, I can actually understand why I did that. Uh, and 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 the truth is, I I I would not have done Sopranos or Lilyhammer or my school curriculum or you know my radio shows, uh, my radio network or, or my my record company or, or, or you know probably none of that would have happened. Yeah. So. You justify yeah, I mean, that way. You sort of rationalize, you know. You've lived this really big life. and Sorry? Know, yeah, I said you've lived this really big life. And uh, I don't know that you do that if you stay with the sure thing. Well, right. You know? You know, but at the time, it seems kind of... Oh, yeah, sure. Terrifying. Yeah. Like you're jumping well, off a building. I mean, I, I actually, on my way to South Africa... It, it it occurred to me, you know, I'm a little bit slow, and, and it occurred to me that I had fucked. I, I'd worked for 15 years, and finally we're just about to make a living. You know, we're we're just about to score, and I leave, you know, and and all the fear of my and my my body left. You know, I had I, I just became fearless at that point, which is you know to, to say suicidal basically. Uh, which really helped me when it came to research, you know, going into like dangerous places, as it turned out, you know, where I didn't care if I was going to live through it or not. And that really kind of does help you get some really good research done that way. Yeah, but, but uh, you know, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. All right. All right. So Sopranos, you make this jump. You're an actor now. You had no experience. Like... Uh, JVL is, is nerdier on this. I'm going to let him take those questions. But I have one big question. Where did all the faces come from? I mean, just as a face actor, as an expressiveness, uh, you know, you would have thought... Because literally, I swear, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, I, I am a music nerd, but just... It, it just never E Street never really like like and I've gone back and listened to your other stuff, which it was actually more to my liking after I saw you on the Sopranos. But Bruce never really spoke to me. But um, so I didn't know who you were on that show, and I was like, this guy's the best character actor on the show. You know, it's a faces Sill. Everybody loves Sill. Like, where did that come from? Well, I, I was really I'm trying to get out of the sun here a little bit. Yeah, that's all right. Um, um. I was very conscious of the fact that uh, I did not want people to recognize me um, and say, um, wait a minute now, I just saw him playing Cleveland last week. You know, um, I was scared to death of that. Uh, and, and keeping in mind, I thought I was on to a whole new career and was never going back to music. All right. Um, you know, Bruce decided to put the band back together uh, after we did the first season. So I wasn't, you know, I'd been out of the band 18 years at that point, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't planning on going back. Um, so um, I went to the gym, you know, and I, I gained like 50 pounds, you know, muscle, and, uh, and I, want, I wanted to walk differently, talk differently, and I practiced different faces in the mirror, you know. Um, you did. What would a smile look like? What would a, how would he laugh? You know, I wanted to do everything different than I could, you know, you know, than my normal self, you know. Um, you know, I, I, I designed, you know, I, I wrote a biography of the guy and he's kind of a romantic, you know, uh, romanticized the earlier uh, uh, eras of the mob, you know, when people weren't ratting each other out. So, you know, he has like a 50s kind of look, you know, uh, and, you know, so I did the, the hair that way. And, and um, I found out where John Gotti got his clothes made. I went to his tailor. And, uh, you know, I really kind of, you know, created the guy from the outside in so I could look in the mirror. I, I felt if I could look in the mirror and see the guy, then I could be that guy, you know. So I, I, I wanted to do, as, as you know, many different things as I possibly could um, so that people did not recognize me. And, um, and, I, and I think it was successful. Uh, you know, I never, I never got a negative word about my acting, uh, whether it was Sopranos or Lilyhammer. I mean... Uh, it was wonderful, you know, it was really nice. There is a sort of like gentleman jockey wins the Derby, you know, like, so, so, you know, like James Gandolfini spent his whole life in like a you know, regional theater and working up to this. And you're like this rock God. And you're like, yeah, I'll try acting. 
And you're fantastic at it right off the bat. <laughs> well, it, it helps to have lived lived a lot of life. You know what I mean? Like, you know. Yeah. It's different if also, you're seven. performing is performing, right? I well, mean, is- yeah. And, and life and life experience, I think, counts too. You know, you, you know, it's not like you're 18 or 21. You know, I'm already an old guy when I start doing that. You know? Yeah. So, you know what I mean? So, you, you, and plus, I, I'd spent a lot of my life as a going inside as, as an autobiographical songwriter, you know, which also helps, you know, being in touch with who you are. Um, so I kind of knew who I was and, and um, which would have made it difficult if you, and, and to this day, when I see an actor looking exactly like he looks, um, I am so, I'm so envious of, of that kind of talent because I had to look really different, for, for, you know what I mean? Because I know, I know who I am, you know, looking like this, you know. Uh, I got to, I got to look really different in order to be different, you know. So I, what, I, I what, really, what about you know, the uh, the consigliere experience, you know, the well, Stephen to Bruce and you to James, like did that that had to transfer at least a little bit. Yeah, that was a big. Uh, the, the interesting thing about that is, uh, first of all. Um, Oh God, God, it's hard to summarize these things a little bit. But um, I, I, David wanted to cast me as as Tony Soprano, um, and I went down and I got and, and and I got cast as Tony Soprano. And then HBO was like, "Are you out of your fucking mind? You know, this, this guy never acted before in his life, and we're this is the biggest ex, big expense we've ever had." You know, they were a little, you know, they had, they had a football replay show. HBO was yeah. Nothing. This is their first for for you young know. kids listening to this. This is before HBO became HBO. This is the show that got them into original programming. Yeah, they were they were like football highlights, as you know, and yeah. and, and old movies, 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 you know. Yeah. So this was a big expense, and they're like, "You're going to depend on a guy who never acted before." He said, "Get the fuck out of here," you know. So so David comes back to me, says, "Ed, they won't let me cast you um, as a, as Tony. What else you want to do?" You know. And at that point, I said, "You know." Now that I think about it, because it's been such a, a you know, rush, um, I'm kind of feeling guilty about taking an actor's job, to be honest. You know, and my wife's a real actor. She went to school and did all the off-Broadway stuff. I see what they go through. I said, you know, I, I, I you know, I feel a little guilty about taking an actor's job. I mean, I'm a, you know, half a hippie guitar player off the street, you know. <laughs> uh, and he says, all right, then I'll, I'll write you in a part. You're not going to take anybody's job. I'm going to write a part that doesn't exist. What, what do you want to do? I'm like, well, I don't know. Uh, I never really thought about acting before, but I, I, I have thought about writing. And, and I had a treatment about a, about a hitman named Silvio Dante. And, uh, you know, he kind of, um, he had a club and, and, um, and, and the, uh, all the five families would have their tables and the police commissioner and the mayor and, it's kind of a you know a goomba version of Casablanca, you know, uh, and, and they would hire my independent hitman to do you know to settle scores and you know, um, and he says, well that's a, that's a cool idea, you know, and, and um, he comes back a couple of days later and says, uh, HBO can't they, they can't afford it, so we'll, we'll make it a strip club, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, and you'll run the club for the family, and that was about all we all we thought about at that moment. Okay, so now what's interesting to me, looking back, here's David Chase, the most detail-oriented guy in, in the world. And he writes these, like, 15 interesting characters, all of which could have had spinoff shows, okay, and, and successful yes, ones, I think. You know, 12, 15 characters. But he doesn't write anybody as the underboss or the consigliere. Now, sometimes they're the same guy, sometimes they're two different guys. But, you know... But there's no underboss role and there's no consigliere role. And, um, and, you know, it's not discussed at all, you know. And as we, as we go on, you know, me and Jimmy just got along really well, I think because he was just basically a character actor that was thrust into the spotlight, you know, yeah. as a lead guy. You know, he wasn't ever comfortable with that. And I'm kind of a, you know, and I'm a band guy. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a side guy naturally. Also, you know, I don't, I don't love the spotlight either. So I think we bonded on that basis, and we got along really well. And I think people, you know, the writers saw us getting along, and um, 
And then by the end of the first season, just by, you know, filling that vacuum, I became the consigliere and underboss. And, and, um, and without any discussion, you know, without it having actually been written in. Uh, and at that point, of course, um, I, I was very comfortable, you know, um, knowing those dynamics from, from my relationship with, with Bruce. So I was able to, um, to really, you know, really uh, inhabit that role uh, very, uh, very well. Yeah. Do you ever, uh, do you ever worry that, I mean, Silvio's a bad guy. Do you ever worry about the glamorization? People talk about that with, with mob stuff, right? Because the thing about great mob dramas is that you wind up rooting for, you're rooting for Michael Corleone, right? Yeah, you're the, rooting the, for Tony. Yeah, there's, there's going to be some of that. You can't help it. But but uh, I don't think we can go any more out of our way to be less glamorous than this show. If, totally if you, agree. You know, totally if, agree. If you look back yeah. on it, I mean, the fact is. What Paulie's guys, living with his mom. You know, this, this, this ain't the Roaring Twenties anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, a lot of these guys are sitting around reading the ration form, you know, half, you know, half the day. I mean, and and uh, and 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 David was very, very uh, consciously, you know, the 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 lighting was almost documentary. Okay, um, there's no camera moves. There's really no stars. You know, I mean. Uh, you know, uh, Lorraine had a, you know a little bit of some yeah, Goodfellas, yeah. but she was so different in this that you know it almost negated it. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, too many you know too many subplots, too many characters, no stars, no sexy camera moves, no sexy lighting. I had to talk David into putting more songs into the pilot because I was like, well, you know, let's give this thing a chance. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, a bunch of ducks comes into a, a, a mob boss's pool and they, <laughs> and, they, and they take off and he, and he has a nervous breakdown. That's the basis of a hit show. You know, you know, uh, you know let's throw it was a good soundtrack to season one. So thank you for that. That was a good yeah. ad. <laughs> yeah, but, but, well, he, he, he loves the music. That's, that's, that's his favorite thing. It's putting the music in. But anyway, um, so I, I don't, I don't think it could be less glamorous to be honest, no. uh, you know, um, but you're going to get a little bit of that. I, I remember to this day walking down the street after I, you know, uh, killed Adrian, you know, killed, uh, you know, that's right. After I shot that, you know, uh, you know, the poor girl, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, how did, Christopher ever, <laughs> you, how did Christopher ever forgive you, Sil? How did Christopher? How did Christopher ever forgive you? People were congratulating me. <laughs> uh, you know, they say, "Yeah, that you got him, Sil. You know, you got her. You know that that rat. You know." I'm like, "What's the matter with you? You know, <laughs> are you nuts? Well, this is <laughs> you know? isn't this specifically why David Chase ended the show with Tony getting whacked by members only because he really wanted to underline to people that that this is like you know. Th- Tony, you were rooting for Tony, but Tony's not a good guy, and Tony doesn't get to die in his bed. Well, that it, it, he doesn't get he doesn't get whacked. I mean, it, 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 it's left it's left to, up to your imagination. But the Great idea, question he tried he tried to trick you there. That was a good effort. <laughs> the, the 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 idea being, yeah, you're going to be looking over your shoulder your whole life. You know, yeah. I think that was implicit. Uh, you know, they, they they did a big a big thing in Vanity Fair uh, like ten years after we went off. Oh, the I remember. Air. Yeah, <laughs> and I think, I think I ended it. I ended the article when they, you know, like what really happened, you know. <laughs> and I said, "Don't worry, I'm going to tell you what happened. All right, but this is just between me and you, and that's it. Okay. And then I don't want to hear this question ever again. Okay. All right, 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 right. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. All right, all right. Here's what happened. You know what happened? The director yelled cut, and the actors went home. <laughs> <laughs> that's what fucking happened okay <laughs> so you know but uh i think the implicit yeah you know w- was yeah you, you look be looking over your shoulder your whole life it's not really a good way to make a living but i'm, I'm telling you there hadn't been anything glamorous about it the whole the whole seven seasons you yeah. know i don't think how did know. silvio's story end did you have a because we never write you he's in a gets coma. left in the hospital bed he's, he's in a home. did you in your own mind have a what happens with him? How his yeah, story continues? Yeah, I had something in mind. I, I got a whole script of of a of a of a of a, of a, of a sequel. Are you kidding? Oh, <laughs> spin off. All right. So if we can just find a premium cable network to bring back the circus and bring back like part of the deal, part of the deal is we want the Silvio Denou- the Duma, denouement. 
Yeah, I, I took the uh, the treatment that I had. We got the idea from uh, for Silvio, and I and I, I finished the screenplay. So it's a, it's a finished pilot now. But um, but yeah, he's in a coma, so he's still he's still alive, just in case, you know. All right, well, we, can, we can pitch those two together. We can pitch <laughs> those two together. Maybe Pluto or somebody. I don't I don't know who's got money uh, these days. To, Apple. Um, <laughs> Pluto. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of these lesser, one of these lesser streaming. <laughs> Samsung channel. TV Plus on my Samsung. I, whenever I turn on, they've got Samsung TV Plus. They're trying to push on me. So maybe one of them <laughs> can do the circus and the Silvio coma show. Uh, this has been so ple- so great, uh, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, for doing it, for taking the time here on Christmas week. Um, and uh, I was just, I'm going to get back on that Sopranos. I just pulled this up, that Sopranos soundtrack from that for the first season, that our little R.L. Burnside number. There's just so much good stuff. So yeah, I'm going to maybe yeah. spend my Christmas rewatching some of that. Dave, David loved doing that, honestly. If you ask him what his favorite part of the show was, it's picking the music. So he loved that stuff. And uh and then I got a chance to do it myself on Lily Hammer. You know, I, I picked all the music for that. So, yeah. um, I need to I need to binge Lily Hammer. Yeah, you know, a lot of people missed it because it was the first show on Netflix, the very first show. Yeah, I need to do it. I need to do it. It's on my list. Uh, Steve Van Zant, thank you so much. It was a total honor that you would do this. Uh, your book, Unrequited Infatuations, uh, your memoir. People should go get that. You're back on tour next year. Yes, yeah, Bruce. Going back in it's March. happening. In March. Yep. Back yep. on tour starting in March. Folks can go check that out. And uh, I hope to see you in New Orleans sometime. I can I can buy you a cocktail. Definitely. All right. And then and I guess we'll see you on set, you know, which whatever streamer out there we get to to get the uh, Silvio uh, uh, show. Yeah, I hope so. All right. You Th- too. Thank you so much, my man. Thank we'll you, see you soon. Uh, and again, I would and I would recommend your book too to everybody. Very, well, very I good. I appreciate that. Very good. It really means a lot. Thank you so much.